Coming up on this Thursday edition of Newsline at Noon, despite predictions by North Korea watchers that Pyongyang will likely resort to launching provocations after the recent purge of top officials, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un calls for improved inter-Korean relations, urging the South to end its hostile policies towards the North. Tensions in Northeast Asia show no sign of subsiding in the new year after Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe vows to bolster territorial claims and strengthen his country's military might. Another Japanese cabinet minister visits the controversial Yasukuni war shrine. Plus, buoyed by the global economic recovery, Korea's exports are expected to reach 600 billion U.S. dollars this year, up more than 6 percent from last year's record performance. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. Thanks for joining us. You're watching Newsline at noon. I'm Choi Yuzhan in Seoul. Very good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, in a surprise move, extended a softer message to South Korea during his New Year's address Wednesday, calling for better ties with Seoul. Our Han Dae-un looks into what his friendly words could imply. North Korean leader Kim Jong-un delivered a rather conciliatory message toward South Korea on Wednesday. We must create an atmosphere to improve ties between the two Koreas. I will work together with anyone who values our people and seeks reunification to improve relations. Seoul's defense ministry has said it expects more provocative acts from Pyongyang targeting South Korea sometime around March of this year, following the execution of Chang Song Tech, Kim Jong-un's uncle, who was once the North's second most powerful man. Despite the unexpectedly friendly tone of his speech, however, most experts echoed the government's view. The conciliatory message is not worthy of special attention. North Korea has sent friendly messages in the past before carrying out provocations. I think the New Year's address implies Kim Jong-un's hopes for stability rather than for sincere reconciliation with South Korea. The North Korean leader also mentioned the execution of Chang Song Tech, although not by name. Referring to his uncle as factionalist filth, he said that removing him has strengthened the ruling Workers' Party. Pundits say mentioning the execution in detail in the New Year's message is a rare move and reflects his still nascent leadership. But they say what really needs to be noted is that Kim put greater emphasis on Pyongyang's ideology education which calls for blind loyalty to the regime than before. This shows that Kim Jong-un's leadership has not reached a stable stage yet. The New Year's address in general contains no special messages nor dramatic changes in North Korea's policies. The experts also note that almost half of Kim Jong-un's 12-page New Year's address conveyed his desire to improve the state's economy. The leader stressed the importance of agriculture and new construction to enhance the standard of living of the North Korean people. Han Dan, Arirang News. South Korea has issued a clear warning to North Korea that it will not put up with any funny business. In his New Year's letter to the nation's commanders and chiefs of staff Wednesday, Defense Minister Kim Guan Jin said South Korea had achieved peace and prosperity by overcoming numerous crises and the military stands ready to protect the nation's important values. He also stressed the country's armed forces would respond immediately, precisely and sufficiently to any provocations. South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon Byung-se and his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi held telephone talks on ways to maintain stability on the Korean peninsula following the recent execution of the North Korean leader's uncle. Both sides also reaffirmed that they will continue strategic cooperation to bring about denuclearization on the Korean Peninsula. The new year is a time to make amends and bury old hatchets, but it's going to take a lot to convince Korea to rebuild relations with Japan following recent high-profile visits to a controversial war shrine and Tokyo's incessant claims to Korean territory. Our Kim Ji-yeon has more. 
As we begin 2014, bilateral relations between Korea and Japan are on the worst foot possible, largely due to a series of visits to the controversial Yasukuni Shrine in recent days. A member of Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's cabinet paid a visit to the shrine, which honors Japan's war dead and several Class A war criminals on New Year's Day, less than one week after Abe shocked everyone with his own visit. Yoshitaka Shindo, Japan's internal affairs and communications minister, said he visited the shrine to pay respect to those who lost their lives in war. The Yasukuni Shrine is viewed by Korea and China as a symbol of Japan's wartime aggression. Abe's New Year's address also hit a nerve with Seoul and Beijing, where he called for, quote, building a new Japan vowing to defend Japanese territory, including its territorial waters and airspace. Abe pledged to upgrade Japan's defense measures over the islands in the East China Sea, known as Senkaku in Japan and Diaoyu in China. Japan will also mark its annual Takeshima Day on February 22nd, which calls for Korea to return Korea's easternmost islets of Tokto to Japan. The Tokto islets, known as Takeshima in Japan, are Korean territory and are under Korean jurisdiction. Abe also suggested the country's pacifist constitution imposed on Japan after the Second World War should be amended by the year 2020. Japan's constitution currently limits its military to self-defense only. Abe also called for a more patriotic tone in the country's history textbooks, backing changes to how the Second World War is taught in schools. The Korean government is planning to call for changes to Japan's nationalistic stance by gaining support from the international community. South Korean Foreign Minister Yoon byung sae is due to visit Washington this month, followed a visit by Shotaro Yachi, a special advisor to Abe's cabinet. Kim ji Arirang News. After passing the 2014 budget bill and other key bills in the wee hours of New Year's Day, Korea's rival parties are now turning their heads to local elections set for June. Now, political correspondent Kim Yeon ji reports. The ruling Tenori party is determined to win a landslide victory in the June local elections, in which more than 3,900 local government seats are up for grabs. It plans to harness all party resources and energy for the elections in a bid to empower the Park Geun-hye administration. As the first regional elections under the Park administration, the June elections will serve as an interim evaluation of our presidency. It's time for us to pull up our collars and approach the public with a humble heart and integrity. We must make 2014 a year that guarantees a bright future for the party. The stakes are particularly high for the main opposition Democratic Party, which suffered a string of election defeats starting with the 2012 presidential election. It plans to appeal to voters by accusing the Park administration of worsening the people's livelihoods and the nation's democracy. In addition to protecting democracy and the people's livelihoods, we need an election victory this brand new year. The Democratic Party recognizes the need for all-out reform and strengthened internal unity, as it has not only the ruling party to battle, but also a new party led by independent lawmaker An Cheol Su. An is pushing ahead with plans to form a third party that he says will overcome the old politics of the two-party system. His new party is fast gaining popularity in the southwestern Honam region, which has long been the Democratic Party's traditional power base. The old system and way of thinking that wants to keep its vested rights by settling for regionalism and refusing to perform itself while talking down on the other must be eradicated starting in the Honam region. An's new party is sure to split the opposition vote, but An has stressed that he won't merge with others, like he did in the 2012 presidential election when he unsuccessfully joined with the DP to try and get their candidate Moon Jae-in elected president. Kim hyun ji Arirang News. In economic news now, and Korea's trade surplus surged to a record high last year despite the economic uncertainties gripping the globe. With the world's economy showing steady signs of recovery this year, Korea's exports are expected to reach close to 600 billion US dollars in 2014. Ji Myung Gil reports. The future looks rosy for the Korean economy in the new year. 
Korea's trade surplus widened to a new high of 44 billion U.S. dollars in 2013, as exports continued to go at a steady pace while imports dwindled. The yearly export total for 2013 came to $559 billion, the highest in the country's history. Strong outbound shipments of mobile phones, home appliances and semiconductors drove the record figure. For the first time in three years, semiconductors sat atop the export list. The economic recovery seen in many Western economies is likely to help Korea's exports stay on the upswing in 2014. Korean automakers are hoping to sell more cars in the U.S. this year as the U.S. economy continues to pick up steam. The shipbuilding industry also expects a positive year, estimating double-digit growth. Orders for offshore structures are on the rise. If the orders go well, it will boost exports this year. Korea's steel industry faces a less certain 12 months. China's steel production capacities have grown rapidly, threatening Korean steelmakers. It has become another China risk factor. The weak Japanese yen may act as another hurdle to Korea's outbound shipments. But thanks to the international popularity of key product items, Korea's exports may break into new territory yet again this year. Kim young Arirang News. Public utility charges such as gas prices and post-delivery services are rising in the new year. The move has drawn criticism from some quarters as it increases the financial burden on low and middle-income households. Kim Minji reports. Public utility charges are rising sharply from the start of the new year. With the price of food also on the rise, the price hikes are almost certain to increase the financial burden on households. Following hot on the heels of hikes in electricity and raw material prices, these increases are expected to occur over a wide range of fields. Starting January 1st, the Korea Gas Corporation raised the price of natural gas by roughly 5.8 percent. The price of gas for households went up by 5.7 percent, translating into an additional four U.S. dollars per household per month. The industrial sector saw a 6.1 percent increase and the service sector a 5.5 percent hike. The hike follows a lift in electricity rates in November last year by an average of 5.4 percent in an attempt to curtail the nation's heavy electricity use. Transportation rates are also set to go up this year. The Korean Railroad Corporation is expected to increase rail prices by about 5 percent. The city of Ulsan is also considering plans to raise bus fares by 5 percent, while the western port city of Incheon raised taxi fares by an average of 17 percent last month. Post office parcel delivery service fees are also slated to rise starting next month. The Korea Post said an additional dollar will be added for packages, while it is also expected to impose transaction fees. The increase is the first in nine years in a bid to make up for the deficit in postal services due to the reduction in post volume. The price of food and beverages has also gone up. Major confectionery companies, Lotte and Hete, have or are about to raise prices by an average of 11 percent and 8.7 percent, respectively. Coca Cola has also lifted the price of its soft drinks by 6.5 percent. Some local bakeries will also raise prices on about a third of their products by an average of 7.3 percent starting January 15. Considering all the price hikes, it shouldn't come as a huge surprise to see that the Ministry of Strategy and Finance expects this year's inflation rate to be 2.3 percent, up from last year's 1.3 percent. Kim Min Ji, Arirang News. The government has come up with a long-term plan to tackle Korea's fine dust problem. The Korean peninsula was blanketed in smog last month, forcing citizens to endure extremely harmful air pollution and poor visibility. Our Sun Jung-in reports. A soupy haze blankets the city and people wear masks to combat the thick layer of ultra-fine dust particles that are thinner than the diameter of our hair and contaminated with hazardous toxins which can cause health problems. 
To combat Korea's growing air pollution problem, the government has come up with a long-term plan to lower fine dust levels, which are considered one of the worst in the OECD. Korea's air quality is very low compared with other major global cities or other countries in the WHO, and it's about two to three times worse than the global standard. The government is aiming to lower the fine dust concentration level from the current 100 micrograms per cubic meter, which exceeds air quality standards, to a level similar to London's 30 micrograms per cubic meter by 2024. It is also aiming to reduce to 20 micrograms the level of ultra-fine particles that are small enough to penetrate deep into the human body. It also plans to reduce fine dust emissions by 35 percent and ultra-fine dust emissions by 45 percent over the next 10 years. To achieve these goals, the government has set aside nearly 4.3 billion U.S. dollars. The main part of the plan focuses on automobile emissions, which account for more than half of all atmospheric pollution in the air. The government will increase the ratio of eco-friendly cars in metropolitan areas to 20 percent by 2024 and to 50 percent at public offices. They will also install 100 additional centers that monitor nitrogen and sulfur oxide emission levels from factories. The Environment Ministry says that if the plan is carried out successfully, it expects the number of deaths from air pollution to be cut in half, from 20,000 per year to 10,000, which also translates to a savings of $570 billion per year in public health and related costs. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. The Korean government held its first meeting of the new year this morning, and for the first time, it was held in the central city of Sejong. The meeting led by Prime Minister Chung Hong won was also broadcast live at the central government complex in Seoul. The government's annual New Year's meeting has been held in Seoul for the past 40 years, but starting this year, it will take place at the government complex in Sejong. Around 600 officials that represent ministries and state agencies in the new administrative hub took part in the meeting. About 10,000 officials of 31 government entities, including the Prime Minister's Office and the Finance Ministry, have moved to Sejong following the second phase of a government relocation plan that wrapped up last December. For your fill of Korean and international news, join Che Yu Sun and Mark Broom every weekday at lunchtime. Newsline at noon. Plenary session this Wednesday and vote on the government restructuring bills. Pope Francis has urged people to accept differences and search for peace in his New Year's message. For more, Park Ji Won reports. Delivering his first New Year's message at St. Peter's Square Wednesday, Pope Francis emphasized the need for sensitive hearts and fraternity for others. The 77-year-old pontiff said people need to pay more attention to violence and injustice in other parts of the world and ask that people not be indifferent or immobile to the suffering of others. What on earth is happening in the hearts of men? What on earth is happening in the heart of humanity? It is time to stop. We need the commitment of everyone to build a more just and caring society. He stressed fraternity as a key foundation to build a true community of the humankind and urged people to embrace difference and take responsibility to make a better world. Return is the belief that we are all children of our one Heavenly Father. We are part of the same human family. We share a common destiny. Hence, each one of us has a responsibility to work so that the world will become a community of brothers who respect each other, who accept their differences and take care of each other. It was Pope Francis' first New Year peace address since he became the leader of the world's over 1.2 billion Catholics in March. Park ji Arirang News. The president of South Sudan is negotiating with his former deputy in an attempt to halt the ethnic murders that have seen over 1,000 people killed over the last two weeks. President Salva Kiir is scheduled to sit down in the Ethiopian capital of Addis Ababa 
with rebel leader Riek Machar to broker a deal on the spiralling civil war in South Sudan. The talks come as the South Sudan government acknowledged that it has now lost the key town of Bor to rebel forces. The United States says it welcomes the talks and reiterated the need to end the bloodshed as soon as possible. South Sudan is the newest country in the world declared separate from North Sudan in 2011. More than 2 million people have enrolled in health insurance coverage under U.S. President Barack Obama's health care law so far, falling below the government's target of 3 million for the end of 2013. The Affordable Care Act went into effect on Wednesday, nearly four years after its passage. Under the law, also known as Obamacare, Americans are required to have health insurance or pay a fine. The government aims to enroll seven of the more than 45 million people estimated to be uninsured by the end of March in the program, which will provide subsidies to low-income patients and set min minimum standards for coverage. It's the beginning of a new year and the start of life for the first babies born in this year of the Blue Horse, according to the Chinese Zodiac. A lot of time and uh, effort goes into naming a baby, especially here in Korea, as our Song Ji-san explains. Korean names may sound similar as many people choose certain letters for the two-syllable first name. The traditional naming process involves five elements of water, fire, metal, earth and wood, indicated at the moment of birth, the date, time and year, based on the Chinese zodiac. Traditional namers then pick certain Chinese letters with positive meanings that can counter weaknesses in the baby's fate. It was mostly the grandfather's job to name a newborn baby, and it was customary for a sibling to share a same letter or a syllable, according to family tradition. Now, is this still the case? Or is there a new trend in baby naming here in Korea? According to a survey by BabyCenter.com, six out of ten Koreans still go to professional namers for their newborns, but more and more parents are less inclined to think a baby's name affects its fate. I don't necessarily think we should name the baby according to the time of birth because if that was the case, all babies born at the same time would have the same fate. These types of parents are not bound to family commitments or Chinese letters, so they tend to seek out more unique names based on Korean words. My first child was a daughter, so we did not have to go with the family's shared letter mandated to sons. So we named her Siam, meaning fountain in Korean. And our newborn daughter is named Ara, meaning sea. Some children are named after celebrities' kids or taller stars from reality shows here in Korea. Over the past five years, Binjun has been the most popular name for boys and Soyeon for girls. Compared to the past, syllables that sound more unisex, like Ji or Bin, have been gaining popularity. More people are also choosing names that can be pronounced easily overseas. More and more Koreans are going for names that are easier to pronounce. They try to avoid complex syllables that are difficult to express in English, like un and a. And with numerous websites around, the process of finding that perfect name is just one click away. Song ji -san, Arirang News. Well, enough about names now. <laughs> uh, we're going to get a check on the weather because it's been a really mild and quite nice uh, day off mm, I had yesterday. Right. <laughs> Actually, I keep thinking it's Monday today. <laughs> Uh, let's get a check on the weather now with our Ijian who's standing by. Hello there, Ijian. Good afternoon, Mark and Yusen. Well, I wonder if you guys had a bowl of tteokguk yesterday. And you know that's the soup with thinly sliced rice cakes that people eat at the beginning of the new year here in Korea. I'm going to say I kind of failed as a, mm. a, a semi-Korean person, I guess, because <laughs> we didn't really eat uh, any tteokguk in our house uh, yesterday. What about you, Yusen? Um, actually, I, I thought I was going to, but then we just ended up having other uh, dishes, Korean yeah. dishes. Oh. Um, but I thought I heard somewhere that uh, tteokguk actually means it's supposed to bring you good luck yeah. for the upcoming year. Yeah. Right, right. Also, Koreans age another year on New Year's Day instead of on their birthday. So uh, it's been said that you have to eat a bowl of duck in order to become a year 
older. Well, I'm sure people who are outside on New Year's weren't shivering because the weather was pretty mild and it looks like the pleasant winter weather will continue today. Also, the level of fine dust particle is back to normal and we should have mostly sunny skies across the nation. So it will be a good day to go out and soak up some vitamin D from the sun this afternoon. And tomorrow will be even milder than today. The high in Seoul will peak at 7 and the area down south will have double digit afternoon highs with a good amount of sunshine. So this first week of January will feature mild temperatures and it's going to be a mild Friday and weekend. So let's enjoy a mild start of 2014 before the cold snap returns later next week. With that in mind, here are the readings for today. Uh, the high in Seoul will peak at 4, while Daegu and Gwangju will both get up to 9, and Busan will enjoy a high of 10. Now let's see how other regions are looking. It looks like Jeju will see a high of 13 in the afternoon, Daejeon and Dokdo will reach 6 and 5, and the top temperature in the area around Mount Kumgang will be minus 7. Now that's all for me today. Have a wonderful rest of the day and back to Mark and Yusan in the studio. Well, thank you very much, Gion, for the weather there. And that does it for this Thursday edition of Newsline at Noon. And Yusan and I would like to wish everyone, on behalf of Ariang, a very happy new year. And stay tuned to Arirang in the new year for your access to stories making headlines here in Korea and around the world. We'll be back tomorrow here on Newsline at Noon.